Ghostwire Tokyo is another Tango Gameworks masterpiece that preceded Hi-Fi Rush, an eventual exclusion of the studio from the Microsoft gaming division. It was announced in 2019 and was frequently mentioned in PS5 advertisements, specifically highlighting the looks of the game and its combat responses reflected by uniquely satisfying haptic feedback of DualSense controllers. But apparently, despite demonstrating pretty decent sales statistics in Japan and receiving an array of accolades, the gaming media of the West was not really satisfied with it. They criticized the lack of polish, the repetitiveness of combat and overall lack of uniqueness that the game has to offer. And let me remind you that this is the same media hyping Vilgard as one of the best games ever, while sharply dumbing down Wukong for not making a game about a mythic monkey inclusive. So if you don't find me sorry for gaming media future layoffs, these are just some minor reasons for that. And that's because only due to the regular giveaways on Epic I've got the chance to play Ghostwire, and let me tell you that after completing each short but very immersive campaign, I hate the gaming industry and gaming media even more. But let's start from the beginning. <laughs> I'll try my very best not to give any major spoilers to the story, so I'll give you just a basic introduction. We've got modern-day Tokyo, attacked by a mysterious group of cultists releasing all the good and evil spirits from Japanese mythology and corrupting the souls of almost everyone alive. This includes the young Akito, who dies during the car crash but somehow finds himself alive soon after. Turns out, he becomes possessed by an unknown spirit, who shares an array of spiritual powers and abilities to seal the evil entity surrounding the city, along with letting the souls of the dead to be released to heaven. In other words, Akito becomes an exorcist and makes his way to fighting the occultist group and revealing all the mysteries about them and himself. Despite all the simple premises, motivations and intentions of the characters, they felt actually alive and relatable due to the perfect Japanese voice acting. On the contrary, the English VA is so out of place that it was worth reading subtitles just not to die from cringeworthy disconnection between the characters and the voices. During the campaign, we get more insight into Akita's story, his connection to the spiritual world, the nature of the spirit possessing him, his past connections and reasons to fight, along with many minor stories from side quests that frequently feature short but greatly written stories of the souls of the local dead. For example, you may encounter a soul of a young boy who wants you to destroy the cursed doll his sister gifted to him before the death. Turns out, the doll protected her from the curse and with it gone, she died leaving the curse for his brother. And while also being quite rewarding, these short side quests are not only emotionally meaningful and visually unique and are actually worth experience. Scene. Me being overburned with modern AAA quests of Ubisoft slash Bethesda style was fully impressed with the unexpected turns of events and emotional appeals even from the minor stories of Ghostwire. And overall, the stories just showed how many anxieties, regrets, fears and sins people do live after they die, and all the sadness and hate is being left to deal to the living ones. Maybe it was me personally, but I can hardly remember a recent game given better emotional connection and make me empathic towards pixels on the screen similar to Ghostwire. Summarizing all the looks and graphical feels of Ghostwire is simple. Imagine Immortals of Evium, but better in almost all possible aspects. It has the same Unreal Engine, but it looks and works better, at least the recent builds with patches available nowadays. And let's remind ourselves that Avium is still laggy and buggy and a graphical mess stylistically. I didn't change no options in graphics and just ran with everything that threw at my machine by default. Turns out, it has great reflections, which is especially impressive and atmospheric during the rainy periods in the urban silence of dead Tokyo. All the streets, offices, buildings and vehicles just look as if I was in actual Tokyo and I'm not sorry for these cheesy comparisons. Obviously, it helps that the game takes place in the eternal night and the neon sights are a lot more vivid, while the enemies 
trees have a lot of room to hide from your sight. I suppose the technical issues were present during launch, but for now, it's one of the better games technically that I've had the pleasure to play. I like how the animations and designs of spells are realized here. We've got three main spells, including a wind pistol, a water wave that slashes multiple enemies in front of you, and a wire shotgun that is powerful but slow as hell. The progression further unlocks using the wind as an automatic rifle, the water as a freezing AoE attack, and fire as something closer to grenade launcher. But but all these attacks don't feel like direct rip-offs from traditional first-person shooters. Instead, they are represented as weakening tools to extract the spirit core, and it makes better sense that in Avium, because you are not that much overwhelmed by the enemies and the most of time tackle them one at a time. But we'll talk about that a bit later. Here we'll need to point that the traditional wind, water and fire attacks are well animated and well performed while demonstrating a bit of creativity despite their obvious inspirations. I'm not gonna lie and tell you that the game has a great variety of enemies to fight, especially in terms of visual diversity. However, I am a huge supporter of the approach of less is more, and here the game does pretty decently with what it already has. It has a couple of designs of faceless men and women in formal suits and office clothes, a couple of designs of schoolboys and schoolgirls, a couple of designs of urban monsters from Japanese folklore, and they are color-coded depending on their strength or elemental affinity. The both designs are also limited and they mostly represent big monstrous animals resembling, once again, the Japanese mythical creatures. However, despite their limited numbers, for me personally, they looked fresh and unique enough compared to the western style zombies, monsters and demons, and that's considering I've played not only the main campaign but something extra, so I believe most of the people would hardly be bored with them during the short campaign that takes up to 8 hours at best. What is a lot better, the interior design and the developer's use of creative styles and effects to make every room creepier than the previous one worth all the praises. I'm a real hater of cheap jump scares, but I'm a huge fan of liminal creepiness and the atmospheric darkness that keeps on building suspense until you meet a resolution in a fight with monsters, and that especially includes the side activities that are definitely worth experiencing as a form of visual art that is not similar to something else. In short, gameplay of Ghostwire Tokyo is doing the main and side activities in the open world, which is basically the condensed and not bloated Ubisoft-style map of Tokyo, with a lot of activities that are actually impactful and rewarding. This concentration of the map is balanced by the city's verticality, giving you a lot of options for exploration and collection of various items for both the upgrade progression and cosmetic returns, as the cosmetics are also quite plentiful here. Story content gives missions with excellent exploration, a couple of atmospheric scares and jump scares from time to time, and a combat session that really needs getting used to. You progress by collecting experience points from combat, exploration and collection of cells that may seem repetitive, but I cannot say that it's the worst in the genre, due to a smaller city, the ability to run away from monsters, explore the interiors and find something new to do. Combat is better with gamepad and mostly consists in you weakening the enemies and extracting their spirit cores, which is better felt with proper rumble or even haptic feedback. I believe if you play on mouse and keyboard, you'll miss a lot of responsiveness and actual feeling of pulling the rotten ghost's core out of the monster. The boss fights are definitely weaker parts of combat, because they either consist of huge chunks of HP that you need to attack in certain patterns, or with the most annoying cat boss, you need to stealth plug all of its tails one by one, and that's it. I get it that their combat style and appearance is more relevant to the story, but yeah, I can't really say I wanted to replay boss fights ever. Leveling up is required and actually matters because it makes you faster, makes the attacks and core extractions faster, while providing stronger versions of the spells you fire at enemies. The variety is definitely not the greatest, but I consider it to be sufficient for gradual progression, and it's not like it's three enemies and that's it. Especially when considered the side activities as even a normal difficulty, they are quite challenging to beat. 
the customization is fun, the collection of various items for vendors is interesting and overall made me feel satisfied with such condensed and concentrated approach to the open world activities that can be easily beaten, but when explored deeper, they are always richer, deeper and more immersive. Final point, you can pet and feed local animals of Tokyo, and if that's not a huge plus for you, it's better become one. So, Ghostwire Tokyo can be summarized like this. Combat is mid and needs getting used to. Graphics were astonishingly great and uniquely looking. I liked every second of walking the virtual streets of Tokyo and its dark corners of various buildings. The story is also impactful and interesting while being quite simple. In total, Japanese voice acting and gamepad make it a really great experience, so I believe it's well worth playing for all the fans of the open world games, especially if you get it with a subscription service, get with a discount or on various giveaways that are quite frequent on digital starfronts. And yes, IGN with its 7 out of 10 can eat sand.